Hello, Dr. Zafar. My name is Jenny Liu. I am a neurocritical care fellow at Beijing Tianjin Hospital. Um, we are very excited to have you sit down with us and talk about your perspectives on the use of AI in, in ICU units. So thank you for being here today. Thank you. I'm excited um, and happy to be here. Thank you. Okay, so could you give us a little bit about your background and your current role at MGH? Sure, absolutely. So um, uh, for everyone, I'm Sahar Zafar. Um, I'm a neurointensivist and I'm also a clinical neurophysiologist. Um, I um, am an assistant professor at um, Harvard Medical School and um, uh, and I, my clinical work is at Massachusetts General Hospital, where I also uh, I'm the associate medical director of the neuro ICU and I run the neurocritical care fellowship program. Um, so a little bit about myself, my sort of uh, research interests really lie at the intersection of uh, uh, neurocritical, neurocritical care and clinical neurophysiology. So particularly around um, EEG application in the ICU and um, and and anti anti seizure treatment strategies and neurocritically ill patients, but also sort of long-term follow-up um, and longitudinal outcomes in these patients. And I employ my research focuses on, it's, it's essentially health services research using comparative effectiveness methods um, uh, to assess sort of the, you know, the comparative effectiveness of EEG monitoring and safety of anti-seizure treatments um, in the critically ill population. Okay. So, um, congratulations on your speech at the WSL conference. You. you were talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning, which I thought was really well done. Um, just because we talk about it a lot in medicine, I don't know. I don't think a lot of physicians really do a really great job of understanding what AI medicine looks like. And more importantly, they don't necessarily do a great job in translating that to their peers. So your speech was really fantastic. Um, one of the things that I'm most curious about is for like an average patient at your unit, what are the most frequently used AI tools that you use? And how do you think that they've helped you in your decision making? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and I think that, you know, even with AI sort of in the neurocritical care realm, it's it's a spectrum, right? We, you know, there's applications of AI and machine learning sort of, you know, in 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 helping guide care and you know predicting long-term outcomes. So there's, you know, I talked about this as well. There's, you know, we use there's so much big data that's generated from neurocritically ill patients with all the multimodal monitoring that we do, um, you know, along with the clinical data, the treatments, the lab data. Um, so AI, you know, there's really utility in using machine learning methods to sort of parse through that data and identify what are predictors of poor outcome, what are predictors of mortality. Um, uh, and then at the same time, you know, in in you can use uh, you know, similar techniques and more immediate forecasting, like who is at risk for neurologic decline? And so, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, there's, there's some automated monitoring of, of course, which doesn't, you know, there's, it's automation. It's not necessarily, you know, translating to treatment, but I think one of the uh, big things is just, um, all the, all the multimodal monitoring that we do with ICP monitoring brain tissue oxygenation monitoring, telemetry monitoring, and, you know, starting to use devices that sort of integrate all this information and process it so that you can look at trends um, in time. Um, and so, you know, using those trends and uh, in um, putting, you know, putting the patient together and, and, and then, you know, making treatment decisions based on that. So, for instance, instead of using just the ICP itself, uh, you, you, seeing what it looks like or the trends look like in conjunction with blood pressure, with brain oxygenation, with the patients, you know, the rest of their metabolic state, and then and then guiding treatments on based on the overall picture and providing really goal directed treatment. Um, other scenarios, you know, I think where EEG monitoring is one place where we're, you know, where um, automation um, and machine learning methods uh, can be very helpful. Starting with the basic, you know, a lot, a lot of our EEG devices now also provide automated software for automated seizure detection, for instance, and alarms that, you know, that that can that can help a bedside provider. And again, this is not, you know, you know, it's not that, you know, the the uh, the EEG has automated seizure detections, you look at that and that immediately translates to care. I think we're still at a point where you want to go back, um, you know, for someone who's reviewing quantitative EEG, for instance, find seizure detections, they go back, um, look at the raw EEG and then make treatment decisions, but at least it can serve as a screening tool that can expedite um, your ability to, you know, identify a change or identify a seizure, identify a potential decline sooner, um, and then institute treatments based on that. Um, I think other technologies include imaging, uh, a lot of imaging analysis, for instance, particularly in stroke patients, look, looking at 
um, perfusion imaging, and we now have, you know, uh, uh, automated tools that, you know, measure stroke or volume infarct that can help guide treatment, uh, you know, especially in thrombectomy cases, for instance, where there are now tools that are available that, you know, you don't have to sit and calculate how big the stroke volume is, that sort of it's automated calculation, there's automated calculation of perfusion mismatch, et cetera, that, that are now helping to guide treatment and, and even stroke intervention. So, so those are sort of some of some of the you know applications. Um, I know we talked about this, you know, thinking more in the future. You know, we we get all this you know data generated from from multimodal monitoring, and there are studies that have looked at, for instance, forecasting ICP based on what the ICP trends were. And I think the future really holds. You know, there's you know hopefully where we go is using all this data to really forecast who's going to worsen or who's at a risk of impending decline and you know um, anticipate that and sort of be ready for earlier and more aggressive treatment as opposed to you know treating in a delayed fashion mm -hmm. well, you make a really good point um i know that you have a specific focus on age monitoring and anti-seizure treatment decision making in the nicu and this is indeed an aspect that could potentially benefit from AI and machine learning. And as you mentioned, just because it creates an overwhelming amount of data through, you know, continuous monitoring and otherwise could not be interpreted by physicians who are not, you know, really professionally trained. But even so, there are like numerous tests that could pro provide information that we could need um, for our diagnosis and prognosis. So you have continuous EEG and quantitative EEG, mismatch negativity, and also surpass, et cetera, et cetera. So for, for those of us who really haven't started using AI in the, in the units, where do you think we should start with? So what are the more better applications to begin with? Yeah, so I think that, you know, um, again, using, um, you, you know, continuous, e, you know, there's, there's obviously invasive monitoring, continuous EEG is, is, um, is, is non-invasive. So it's, you know, it, it is resource intensive in setting it up. Um, and, and, you know, again, um, uh, you know, we're, we're starting to see studies which show that, you know, EEG e e monitoring may have a mortality benefit just because of the downstream treatments that are instituted. So, you know, you, that would be one place to start. And then, uh, you know, where when we're using continuous EEG monitoring, uh, the application of quantitative EEG, which is basically compressing all the, the raw data that you see into spectrograms or power spectral analysis, um, as well as um, you know, amplitude integrated EEG, for instance. And, that, and then you can train the bedside providers. So we've had experience where we've sort of trained nurses to identify patterns on the quantitative EEG, where, you know, in, where you're looking at the entire trend. So instead of you know, second by second, you can see hours of EEG data at the same time. Um, and, you know, and, and there's, you, you can, there's pattern recognition that you can, we can train providers, but even the machine, that's where machine learning comes in, where these certain patterns can be identified by the machine itself, uh, you know, to, 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 you know, mark uh, an area as a seizure. Um, and then when that's highlighted, so, you know, Persist, for instance, has a seizure detector that, you know, they, they mark areas where they think are concerning for seizure. And, and it sort of creates a, you know, I think we're still at a point where it's a collaborative approach, where if the machine identifies a seizure, doesn't translate immediately to the machine, you know, ordering treatment, but it's sort of a collaborative approach where the provider can see these areas which are concerning for seizures based on their own pattern recognition or based on the machine detected seizures um, and, and, you know, can either alert someone alert the expert electroencephalographer to look at that, e look at the EEG, look at the raw data, see if there truly are seizures and, you know, treatment can be instituted as opposed to, you know, I think it varies from place to place. Some places there's continuous EEG review by someone live, other places someone looks at EEG every, you know, few hours. And so as opposed to waiting a few hours before a seizure is being identified, the seizure can be identified sooner um, and, the, and the electroencephalographer can be notified. I think another application, uh, and I talked about this um, yesterday as well, was um, seizure forecasting, for instance, um, really using, uh, and that can help, you know, help us also identify who we should monitor and for how long. So um, there was a study that came out where, and, you know, a score that has been developed called the To Helps To Be score, where uh, you, you use a, comp you know, a composite of EEG findings and clinical findings um, uh, to predict what the seizure risk is over the next 72 hours. Um, and, you know, so the higher the score, so essentially if your EEG, the first 30 minutes of your EEG, you know, first 
to a few hours of your EEG are concerning and there was a clinical suspicion for seizures, the score predicts that you have a very high likelihood of having a seizure in the next 72 hours. So for that, you want to monitor that patient, you know, continue monitoring them so that you can institute treatment sooner. Someone has a low score, you don't need to monitor that patient. So it both helps identify those who are at risk and get the appropriate treatment, but can also help in resource utilization and, you know, you know, discontinuing or not using prolonged EEG when it's really not indicated and, you know, redirecting it someplace else. Okay, thank you. I absolutely agree with that. Um, I think one of the issues that we see is that, you know, the tech world, they look at the medical world and they go there like, like, oh, if, if you have all this data, we could come in and we can consolidate all this data and we can change medicine. But the problem that we really face is that we rarely have people that understand both the technology and also the problems that we are facing in the medical care. So um, there's a saying in Chinese that roughly translated means that um, a difference in profession makes one world, one feels worlds apart. And I feel that that is the, one of the greatest barrier in the development of AI in medicine is that um, the lack of efficient communication regarding our needs and our medical hypothesis. And so is that, or was that a difficulty that you've had to face? And what do you think can be done to overcome this problem? I, I agree, I, you know, and, and I think it's it's both ways, right? You, you know, you look at um, providers who are not, you know, who don't know what, you know, machine learning is and, you know, there's like black box models, what goes, you know, what happens in there and, you know, what do the results mean? And, you know, that creates hesitancy in sort of, you know, using those results to guide treatment. Um, and I think on the tech side, those, you know, engineers who are really, you know, who are tech savvy and who are developing all these algorithms or, or you know, automated uh, devices, um, uh, for them, you know, not having the clinical perspective, uh, you know, not, you know, not be having the experience of treating a patient and, you know, you, there's, it, there's, it's nuanced, right? It's the, the, there's so many things going on, particularly in your critical care. You know, it's not just brain injury, there's heart injury, there's lung injury, there's, you know, it's, it's a complex physiology. Um, and then beyond that, it's, you know, you're also, if the patient is a person, but there's also family and, you know, there's so much more involved in the care of, 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 of the patient that I, I that it, it, you know, the, the tech side doesn't see. And so I think the, the value, you know, where the value comes in is really partnering up with them. And, you know, there are, there are, there are, there, I think the, those who are most successful and are really helping advancing the field are those who have both the, the technology and the engineering background, but also are, you know, physicians and providers um, and sort of, you know, ha like um, starting teams that include such people that can bring, you know, the group together so that, you know, you have both the clinician perspective as well as the tech perspective. Um, and, and, and I think part of the reason we've, you know, managed to, um, uh, so I work with, you know, I work with uh, postdocs, engineers, there's several of us. Um, and, and I think part of the reason some of our research has been successful is that very reason that, you know, every time they, you know, they come up with a model or, you know, they come up with a theory or, you know, they come up with results, they turn to me and say, how do you interpret this? Is this helpful? Is this not helpful? You know, what does this mean? And so there's a lot of back and forth and that's what allows us to sort of move the project forward and move it along. And so I think it really just requires a lot of collaboration. Okay, thank you. That is something that I'll definitely pass on to our mentors and we can try working on that in the future. Um, so when it comes to AI as it applies to medicine, what are some of the things that you are genuinely excited about? I think what I'm most excited about, especially on the neurocritical care side, is really, um, you know, it's, you know, potential future applications in, in um, helping us sort of understand and, you know, bring together, integrate the large amounts of data that we create um, and really, you know, moving towards sort of precision medicine and, and you know, goal-directed treatments in, you know, individualizing patient care based on all this data. So, you know, if we have um, ICP monitoring in a patient along with their brain tissue, along with, you know, blood pressure, all these parameters, using their trends to sort of forecast what's happening in the future, you know, what, 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 what we're likely to see, what the risks are, and really being ready to provide treatment, you know, um, in time or ahead of time to patients. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I think that, you know, um, I think we're still a ways away from that sort of closed loop where the AI just does it all. Um, right now I see really see its application in sort of providing that, um, you know, 
facilitating the clinical care and clinical decision making. Um, and, and um, you know, in neurocritical care, at least multimodal monitoring is a big and growing thing. I think we're having trouble um, in understanding how it impacts outcomes only because it's so complex. Um, and so really using, you know, um, our AI technologies to integrate all the data and really help us understand how the, the data together improves the big picture for the patient. So, um, you work in neuro ICU, of course. So the neuro ICU of the future, what does that look like for you? Um, the neuro ICU of the future, I think it looks like, um, um, we're, you know, sort of. You know, we have, um, we have the, you know, for cardiac patients, for instance, we now have a well established telemetry monitoring system, right? And we do so much on, you know, there's alarms when they go, you know, it automatically detects VFib, VDAC, uh, you know, it sends off alarms, it, it you know, uh, identifies DSATs and, you know, a lot, you know, sends off alarms and, you know, patients really respond, it, providers respond to that. And I think I sort of see the neuro ICU heading towards where we sort of have similar brain telemetry where we're, you know, mo continuously monitoring both in, you know, and it doesn't always have to be invasive. There's so many newer non-invasive technologies that are coming out. So using a composite of those non-invasive technologies to really monitor the brain physiology, you know, we're monitoring procedures and monitoring their ICP, we're monitoring their compliance and, you know, all of that is integrated. And then if there's a decline or there's a concerning pattern, there's alarms that go off and, you know, you, you get, and, and, then, and then hopefully, you know, uh, that can translate to faster treatments as well. You know, I just thought of one thing that I really wanted to ask you. So, um, we've talked a lot about EEG in the neuro ICU. So, like, roughly about how many patients or the percent of, of patients um, in your unit, how often do they get EEG monitoring? Yeah, so we, we use it a lot. Um, and, and I know that it's not a resource that's always available everywhere. We have a 22 bed unit and essentially all of our, all our, all our beds are hard. We can monitor 22 wow. patients at a time if we, if we wanted to, we never get to that number. Uh, but we always have, you know, at least 30, 40% of our patients on continuous EEG. Our typical indications for EEG, of, you know, are, are sort of the standard indications, which is um, post-convulsive status if patients start waking up, um, you know, structural brain injury with exam out of proportion to what you would expect or fluctuating men mental status or paroxysmal symptoms um, that we're trying to rule out procedures. Another indication that we uh, use EEG for is for ischemia detection in subarachnoid hemorrhage patients or high grade uh, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, um, Hunt and Pest 3 and Fisher 3 and higher, um, all get continuous EEG for 10 days. Um, you know, because we've, we've found, you know, there's algorithms that, com you know, uh, combining the EEG findings, um, uh, including, you know, the alpha, like power uh, uh, quantitative EEG, as well as the raw EEG in presence of epileptic form abnormalities that we found um, uh, are very good at predicting um, a DCI. Um, and and so so we, we combine EEG with sort of the TCDs and other modalities for ischemia uh, detection as well. But will that um, be difficult for nurses? Because I know for in our hospital, in our unit, um, nurses have to flip the patient every two hours so that they don't get bed sores. So yeah. would that be a problem when using EG? No, it's not. I think we, you know, we provide a lot of training. Uh, you know, our nurses have a lot of training, and you know, um, uh, um, and and so you know, it's the same for us. You have to do Q two hour position changing, and um, uh, so so we we do the same thing and. Um, um, the, the nurses are, so, you know, used to having, um, or taking care of these patients, uh, that, uh, it hasn't really been a challenge for us. You know, I think sometimes when you're bathing the patient, of course, leads may fall out. And so we do have daily checks and, you know, reapplication of leads, um, um, and fixing of leads when needed, uh, we have the technologists come by. Um, okay. Interesting. Um, so I think that concludes my, my questions on. Uh, neuro ICU, but uh, my final question is if there was one advice that you could give to the fellows across the world, whatever specialty they may be in, so what would it be? Um, one advice. Um, 
I think it's to sort of stay, you know, uh, I know not everyone has sort of their goals identified, but really stay focused, uh, you know, especially when you're on tra in training, there's so many things thrown your way and so many opportunities, you know, coming your way and while you want to take on everything that you can, um, uh, trying to, you know, maintain your focus as well. If there's something that you're truly passionate about doing everything that you can towards that goal um, um, and, you know, and, and learning to identify what, you know, what you should take on and what you shouldn't. I think especially, you know, for those transitioning from trainee to junior faculty level, for instance, um, often get, you know, um, asked to do multiple things. And so just as a part of your career development, really identifying what your goals are, staying focused um, and, and, and working towards, towards those and, and, you know, having, having a good uh, identifying good mentors who can guide you and ensure that you're sort of staying on track towards those things and not being pulled in multiple directions um, is is another key thing. I think um, for me, as I was going through my fellowship training in junior uh, faculty years, um, having the right mentorship and guidance was was truly helpful in, in moving me in the right direction. So find yourself a good mentor um, who can support you and guide you. Um, and your mentor does not necessarily have to be, you know, your research mentor, or your, you know, you don't have to even be working on the same project, just someone who can oversee your overall career development and make sure that you're moving in the right direction. Okay, that is really great advice. Um, so, Dr. Zavar, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time and coming on to this interview. Um, I don't think that there are any questions from the audience. No. Okay. So um, best of all, best of luck to your work in the field of neuroscience. And thank you so much for coming here. Um, we look forward to hearing from you again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.